Hello everybody. Today I'm going to show you how I resold my own pair of Doc Martin shoes. Bought these for $25 on eBay. Um, I just wanted to see if I could do it. I didn't want to spend a lot of money on them. So I bought a used pair and uh, yeah, I got all of the supplies I needed from the Oregon Leather Company. I'm going to put a little pitch there. They've got locations in Eugene and Portland, Oregon. Uh, you can see all the different pieces I'm going to use today. I, like I said, I bought these boots for $25, including shipping. I didn't want to spend a lot of money in case I screwed it up. And uh, they're not regular Doc Martens. They're actually kind of a, um, they're kind of a heavy duty work boot version. And they don't look worn out on the outside. I mean, they look like you could just clean it up a little bit and there's still a lot of wear on the soles. But what happened was uh, Doc Martens have a pretty intensive uh, air cushioning inside of the sole and, and that had worn out when I wore these shoes just one time it was incredibly painful the insides were all worn out so anyway you cut through all of the cut through all of the stitching and you pull it out and then you can see that on these heavy duty work boots they actually have in addition to the regular Doc Martin airwear soles they get these little honeycomb harder rubber pieces and that seems to be what kind of wore out is that the pieces were just like not supporting anymore so I'm pulling off a little bit of uh Hot, hot glue they used to stick the sole on <laughs> or something. Anyway, you can pull out all the uh, yellow stitching. The only regret I have for the whole project, I think, is that I didn't didn't go out and buy some yellow thread to do the stitching with, but I have to do what we gotta do. Yeah, it's cleaning up a little bit and the place is really hard to get to around the welt when the welt's on there. So I thought I'd just go ahead with the saddle soap and give it a good clean up while I had it taken apart. You can kind of see the construction of the sole there. The, the This is a, what they call a um, a weather a weather welt, uh, so it's got a, a raised piece on it. It's all leather. It has to be waterproof later, but uh, it it keeps the water out better. I'm dyeing it black because I've got a black uh, vibram sole I'm going to use. I want to make everything kind of match, so I get it cleaned up. And then uh, I cut the piece what I thought to length. You'll see that I, I misestimated I was too short. But then I have to do all the stitching for this part by hand. I'm doing, in fact, all the stitching on this project by hand. I'm using a saddle stitch. So I've got one thread with two needles and I'm trading them back and forth as I go. It's a lot stronger than doing a loop stitch. And I'd always wondered why when I watch uh, other YouTubers who are professional cobblers and they have to re-welt the shoe, they, they use a, a loop stitch kind of a set up where they have a, um, a hook they push through and then they pull the thread through to make a, a loop just like a sewing machine does and it's not supposed to be as strong as when you do the saddle stitch like this but what I discovered was the space is so small uh, when you're working parallel to the sole the insole of the shoe like that that you don't really have space to do proper saddle stitch it's very slow and uh, you have to, as, I, as you can see, use the pliers to pull the, the needles through sometimes so that the that, uh, hook, hook stitch, loop stitch would actually be uh, an improvement as far as the process. I think it would go a lot faster. The hardest part of this whole rewelting process is going around the turns on the toe and the heel. So you have to get everything to, to pull through and, and fit. You can see I'm an amateur, so I misunderestimated the amount of welt I needed at the beginning and I had to cut some more. Another thing you can see that's a new mistake is that I cut those uh, welt ends as a parallel instead of making them at a diagonal and skiving them down because you could actually make them pretty much disappear if you skived it uh, diagonally and, and then glued it. Uh, so the next time I do this, I'll, I'll do that and make the end of the welt disappear. So now I'm going to put uh, replace the felt pads that were in there originally with uh, cork. So you can see that's the original felt pad out of the midsole of the shoe. And uh, what I'm doing is uh, tracing out some of uh, this cork board material I bought at the hardware store. It's about half as thick as what I need for the inside of the shoe. So what I'm going to do is double it up and just contact cement through the middle so I've got twice as much cork. This is just uh, cork board cork like you would get at the hardware store. When you've got the contact cement to make it really set, you have to put a lot of force on it. In this case, hammering it would just put divots, so I used a roller to smash the two pieces together tracing out where I need to go for the um, cork insets. I'm going to cut this one out. The other shoe I did a little bit differently. As you'll see, I, I used this, this smashing method. It's a little bit less precise, but gets it done. But this one I very carefully cut out the cork piece. And I realized I didn't have anything for a, a shank, and I wanted to have shanks in these shoes. I didn't have shanks originally. So I've seen several videos where people had uh, leather shanks in their shoes and boots. So that's what I had lying around was a 
piece of strapping, so I just cut that up. Here you can see I'm skiving it down on the edges to make sure that it doesn't have any sharp, you know, right risen edges. So it, it sort of smoothly fits in the um, middle of the foot. You gotta contact cement everything together. And then I didn't, I was lazy, I didn't want to do two rounds, so I just put contact cement on both sides of the shank and let it dry. So I can put it in there. Then we get some high speed hammering here. Some folks really like the high speed hammering action. It's entertaining. <laughs> it's, I won't lie, it's pretty funny. Okay, got that together. Now we're going to put the cork in. Uh, that'll actually compress and fit to my foot over time, help make the shoe more comfortable. So I get the cork hammered in so the contact cement sets up really well. And then we pretty much got you know the new welt on and the, the in, inside of the shoe is ready to go. And so I didn't want to just stick the uh, Vibram sole directly to that. I wouldn't it wouldn't stay as well. So I've got some eight ounce leather that's the sort of scraps from other projects here. And I'm going to uh, mark it out and cut it out to put in as a leather midsole. So this is actually an improvement over the Doc Martin design as far as sturdiness. I mean, the Doc Martin people would disagree, I'm sure, because they got their whole airwear thing with the like um, air pockets to give you more cushioning in your feet. And I'm not particularly a fan of that myself. I like the Doc Martin style. I think the boots are great style, but I have not noticed that having the bouncy soles makes my life better. So I'm just as happy to have a more traditional leather leather and rubber uh, sole on these boots now. So I've got to do a lot of sanding of the smooth surfaces of the leathers because contact cement won't stick to smooth surfaces. you gotta, you got to get them roughed up. Um, unlike wood glue, wood glue sticks really well to extremely smooth wood. That's why hand planing is a good way to get wood set up to do wood gluing. But contact cement needs some bite on the surface. So you put it on both sides here and let it dry. Guys, I let it dry for 15 to 20 minutes, depending on how warm it is in the garage, and then stick stick the shoe down. You always want to be careful here because once it sticks, it isn't going to unstick easily. It'll actually start to tear the leather, so you've got to try to get everything lined up right. Yeah, you can see these shoes are pretty worn. The toes are not very strong. They look okay, but they don't have any, any kind of uh, body to them anymore. You can squish those toes pretty good. Okay, more high-speed hammering. going to hammer the leather midsole on so it sticks really well. I'm going to stitch it on around the outside in just a minute, but this is an intermediate step to get the contact cement so it's, it's all handled. And then this this little trick here of hammering on the edge of the shoe anvil is one I picked up from watching the Beto's uh, channel. I'll put a link in the description, but you know I, I picked up a lot of my shoe stuff from th basically three channels. There's Beto's, there's the Trenton and Heath, and then there's the Rose Anvil. Rose Anvil actually did a resole of some Doc Martens, and that's what inspired me to do this. So I'll put the links to all three of those channels and to the Rose Anvil Doc Martin um, uh, video as well. Having to smooth out that wealth a little bit, I smashed it a little bit too much when I was hammering. So then you go around, you cut out that, that leather to get it as close as you can, and I'm actually going to hand sand it. You could use the power sander for this part too, but the leather's soft enough that it, it cleans up pretty well with just a block and some 200 grit sandpaper. If I was doing, you know, 100 shoes a day, I would probably use the power sander for all of it, but since I'm just doing this one pair of boots for me, I did use a power sander on the rubber soles. Those uh, Vibram soles are extremely difficult to sand. They are very tough, hard-wearing soles, which is good. They last a long time, but that means it's hard on your sanding belts and stuff. I'm setting up my stitching groover to have the right distance for the welt. And I have to put it onto the anvil to be able to do the grooving here just because of the geometry of it all. So you can see me taking the tool and making the stitching groove all the way around. Because I put a new welt on, there's no holes pre-marked. So I'm actually going to mark the holes on the bottom, uh, which is easier for me since I'm hand sewing. I go around a total of three times with the groover to get a deep enough groove that I'm satisfied that all the stitches are going to lie down flat. I don't want them sticking up because I want to have a really good contact between the vibrant sole and that leather because this contact cement between the two is going to be the only thing holding that vibram leather sole on. Well, the main thing holding the vibram leather sole on. Yep, so here we've got my little stitching wheel. It's just like a spur and it goes around and it pokes little holes to show me the distance to put the stitches in. And this is the widest stitching option that I had. I think it's about uh, seven or eight stitches uh, per inch. But going, going over this and thinking about it again, I could actually have skipped 
a hole and done half as many stitches all the way around, it would have been just as just as well. It would have looked more like the, the standard Doc Martin stitching. It's a little bit tighter stitching than they do for Doc Martin. I used some thread from the main thread company. I actually didn't show most of the stitching. I just skipped from the beginning to the end, but there you can see it's all the way around. I think I used a coffee colored thread for this because that's something I had lying around. This is just for me, so I wasn't too worried about it. I can put a link to the main thread company in the description too. That's that's where I get my hand sewing thread for the most part. So just trying to get those stitches to lie flat, hammer a little bit more, and I'm going to sand a little bit more because again, this is this is the thing that kind of hold that sole on. Is this is this contact cement? Got to sand the Vibram sole too. It comes from the factory. It's not I don't think rough enough to stick very well. I've seen uh, some other folks actually put an acetone on to try to pull some of the oils out from the release agent from when they made them at the factory. That's probably a good idea. I didn't do that on this because I hadn't seen that before when I made this video. Yep, so the contact cement's what's going to hold that, all that's going to hold that Vibram on, really. I mean, there'll be some nails too, as you'll see. I almost screwed it up. I didn't quite get it lined up, but I was able to get it in place. There we go. Vibram sole and some more hammering. There you go, high speed hammering. More more hammering around the edges to get that welt set. Like I said, the rubber on these Vibram soles is extremely hard, and so it'll wear the belts out on the belt sander really fast. It's and it's just a pain. pain. It, it smells really bad too when you're power sanding it. So getting as much of it cut off before you go is important, I think. You can see how difficult it is for me with this box cutter. I actually changed to a fresh box cutter blade last year. Now, here you see me working with the belt sander, and don't don't do it like this. So if you're doing something like this yourself, do not put the sole perpendicular to the belt like that. What I discovered to my chagrin after I got all this done was that uh, what happens is the belt pulls it down and the softer leather will actually get undercut relative to the much harder rubber and you end up with little undercut spots and it looks it looks bad and it's not as good for uh, both waterproofness and just uh, having a solid uh, contact. So it's a little bit like, oh yeah, here, the first heels I bought, size 14 heels, too small. Turns out that the heel sizes do not reflect the shoe sizes. So to go from a size 14 to a size 18 heel, I wear size 13 shoes and it's a size 13 sole, but the heel needed to be an 18 for it to be the right size. Just a warning out there for anybody else who's trying to get into this. Make sure that you bring the shoes with you and actually look at those heels when you're buying them. Yeah, so as far as it goes with the sanding, um, it's a little bit like uh, when you have a resistant layer of rock and uh, a softer layer underneath and you get kind of a, an overhang uh, from erosion. That, that's sort of what's happening as a consequence of sanding perpendicular to the sole. What you should always do is hold this shoe uh, so the sole is parallel to the direction of the belt. The edge of the sole is parallel and that'll keep you from getting that undercut it'll make everything look a lot nicer i'll show you later on i've got a little bit of a snippet of after i figured this out and then the contact cement here isn't what going to hold that heel on it's just to keep it in position while i'm nailing it so it's pretty solid but that would not keep the heel on it would come off pretty quickly over time trying to use it so some hammering here just to set the contact cement up that not expected to actually keep everything together over the lifetime of the shoe. But you can see that it's got a series of little nail holes in the heel and uh, the next step is to actually uh, tack that heel down with the nails. And here I'm, I, I cringe looking at this because I'm using my really nice polished head leather hammer at first. <laughs> I forgot I needed to switch over. Now I got the ball peen hammer, I'm not too worried about the head on that one. And so what happens is you got that steel uh, anvil that the shoe sits on and as you hammer those nails through the heel into the insole, they hit that anvil and they actually bend over and crimp down so that in the end they're not just uh, 
nailing it in, but they actually crimp over or curl around and they, they hold, they suck that heel on. Yeah, I'm using just a regular nail set to push the nails down into the recesses there on the heel. And it, it seems to work pretty well. I, I did this back in November and I've worn these shoes on several long hikes. I actually walked for four hours straight one day over spring break in these boots and uh, no problems. Everything's staying together really well. Heels have not shifted at all. They're wearing in, of course, but, but no issues related to the construction. So I'd watched some videos with, uh, with some shoes like this where people had actually set nails in between the cleats on the front of these fibrum soles. And so I did that on this left shoe when I, when I first did it, but I didn't bother to do it on the right shoe, you'll see. And I'm doing this kind of as an experiment to see if they ever come apart. Like, does it matter that I set nails in the, into the left shoe and I didn't set nails in the right shoe in the um, front part of the sole? Again, this is cringy. Don't, don't sand sideways like this. Sand this way. I figured it out finally. So the heel looks a little bit better than the rest of it. That's the way to do it. And I'm cleaning it up here. Uh, for this shoe, I tried treating the edge of the leather there from the midsole and the welt with some uh, edge shoe edge dressing. It didn't work out so well. I'll show you that in a minute. First, I wanted to change out these uh, D loops on the top with uh, qu uh, quick lacing boot, boot hooks because uh, it's just a hassle to put boots on and off if you have to run the laces through either eyelets or those, those D loops every time. So, um, so I replaced uh, all these at the top with these quick hooks. And they, they're uh, basically like tubular rivets. I had a tubular rivet tool, but it wouldn't work on them. They're, the, they're too big a size for the tool that I've got. So what I ended up doing was using a Phillips, a stubby Phillips head to um, pierce the tube, split it into four pieces. And then I come back with the ball peen hammer and then smash those four pieces down kind of like a um, dogwood flower. See, it looks gross. If I was going to do this for somebody else's shoes, I, I would go buy the right tool, but I didn't feel like spending the money on the tool at, at this point, just for me. And then to, to hold that uh, D loop in, I'm putting it in the recess on this little anvil and I'm putting a piece of scrap steel in to kind of hold it in place. There we go. That's a really good shot of it pedaling up. Uh, I splurged a little bit, got myself some really nice uh, insoles to replace the worn out Doc Martin one. The guy at the shoe store gave me some advice. He said, use a fat marker to trace and then cut around the outside edge of the line because the insoles actually kind of runch up and, and shrink a little bit over time. So if you want to make them fit really well, you have to add that, that little like 16th of an inch. And honestly, with those insoles and these Vibram soles, these are my favorite shoes now. These are the most comfortable shoes I've got. Yeah, so I did that, that edge dressing that kiwi edge dressing, it didn't really last very well. I ended up having to go back and redo this boot like I do the other one with uh, uh, black dye. I just dyed the other one black as an experiment to see which one would last longer. Obviously the black dye one did. Lacing it up, just seeing how it works. I ended up actually going ahead and doing two more of the um, eyelets, replacing them with the uh, speed loops later. So this is a comparison. The original boot weighs two pounds, 3.2 ounces with the original Doc Martin sole on and then when I read it it's two pounds 2.8 ounces so I'm saving just a you know a little half part of an ounce okay then I'm going to go through and do the other shoe really fast at 40x speed so this is 10 times faster than all the rest of the video but I wanted to show it because I did it yeah, and I learned from my mistake and I made the welt extra long for this one. I still didn't do the angled skiving to make it slick, which I should have. You can see, there we go, putting on the leather shank, getting the cork in. And see there, I just put the cork on and hammered it in until it smashed into the spot and then cut off the excess. It seems to work okay too, but I, I think I would go ahead and do the cutout just because it, it looks a little bit nicer and nobody's going to ever see it inside the shoe, but I know it's there. There we go, hammering everything together again. I'm gonna cut out that extra leather so I can stitch it. Sanding everything again so that it'll stick really well. Gonna groove it, 
groove, groove, groove. Then sewing it all the way around. Cut most of the sewing out again. That's the big time time sink. But you know, I don't have I don't do enough of this to be worth buying one of those machines that stitches soles on. Hammer that sole on that vibram outsole. Get it set. Cut off the excess. And I don't show on the I don't show on the belt sander, but I sanded this down. And man, it's stinky. It produces lots of really gross dust from it too. You wear your wear your wear your breathing protection when you're doing that. Put the other sole on. Throw on the nails in, and then sinking them subsequently with the nail set. Oh, and then <laughs> this takes forever because I accidentally bent one of them, and I had to get it out and put a straight one in. It didn't mark, make any difference to that heel though. It it did not get marked by having the bent nail in. Okay, yeah, then I went around, I actually did bevel the edges on this one, and then I, you can see I dye it with some of that same Phoebing's dye. And then I have to do the, the D-loop D replacement with the speed hooks. Pretty fast, when it's 40x time. You can kind of see it, them flaring out there. And then I went ahead and I actually buffed this edge uh, using gum tragant and a piece of uh, canvas. I think that's actually a better way to do it. Uh, if I do it again, I'll just do it that way. I didn't like the way that Kiwi edge dressing came out. So there they are, they're both done-ish. I decided I wanted to go ahead and do two more uh, eyelets on each one. So here we go, it's another good shot of the spreading out the, <coughs> the tubular rivet making it into a little flower. So there you go. Three speed loops, new Vibram soles, new insoles, super comfy. Um, you know, it looks a little bit chewed up on the edge because like I said, I, I was not using the belt sander right. So that's the lesson there. Go parallel to the belt. But like I said, they're super comfy shoes. Uh, they wear really well. They're great traction. And uh, you know, I think I probably did put as much money into it as if I bought a new pair. Uh, total and think about buying the soles and the things and you know but if I'd paid a if I'd paid a cobbler to do it, it would be way more expensive so thanks for watching if you enjoyed this video please give me a like uh, maybe subscribe I do other stuff with uh, shoes I do leather crafting I've just bought a leather sewing machine so I'm making all kinds of stuff top kits and things I'll be doing some knife making later on I also collect watches and uh, I'm gonna be actually rebuilding some antique watches so Thanks for watching. Uh, stick around if you like it. Um, let me know what you think in the comments and uh, be safe. All right.